Praise God, praise God. My Lord Jesus Christ lives today. Hallelujah. If y'all grab your hymnals and turn to page 161, He lives. He lives. to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. First Peter 1 Peter 1.3 Amen. Amen. Want to say one more? Sure. I just wanted to change things up a little bit because the day it is. 
So if you'll all bow your heads for the opening prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today on a glorious and great day, the raising of your Son, Jesus Christ, from the grave to give us our salvation through his death and then his resurrection to give us everlasting life, a gift that we never deserve, but he loved us so much for what he did on that cross. And we are so glad to have him as our Lord and Savior. And we ask that you come into your house and touch each and every one of us this day as we praise, honor, and glorify you in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen and amen. Our prayer needs, our prayer needs, of course, all of us in the congregation and even our visitors, we all need a little help, and he's there for us whenever we need it. So I say that each of us that are sitting here need a prayer, because you know the devil's fighting all of us. He's, he's, he's coming after us hard everything that's going on in this world. So we all need prayer. Still have Julie on the prayer list. And Irene, Patton, you know, her problems. Jaden with his finger. We're hoping that everything turns out really great. And Brother Mike Combs, where Ralph, Brother Ralph's at today, he's getting better, he's getting stronger, but he still needs prayer. And we would like to welcome Alicia's mom. And is this your friend, Jaden? My granddaughter. Oh, uh, oh, your daughter? Granddaughter. Granddaughter. Oh, okay. <laughs> Man, I'll tell you. It's a sister. Okay. I just... No. My memory goes... You're well. She's like friends. My, well, my memory... I mean, my, you know. We all have old. that moment. She's old. That's okay. it. Getting there. Getting there. Oh, I can just, just to inform... You look at that. You like that, Alicia? Spread it up, yeah. Yeah. Now I don't have those stragglers that you were always bugging about. Oh, Lord. You know, we are a family here. We can't just bring hands up with each other. Yes. I can only see what the people will think on our Facebook page with all this going on today. They can see that we're happy and having a good time right. with the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Amen. If you'll bow your heads one more time, we'll do these prayer requests. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you so quickly again. We have prayer needs. You know that all of us and our brothers and sisters in Christ, the devil's working hard. Just wrap your arms around us, Lord. Give us your shield of protection. We know that you do care about us and are there for us. We also ask for Julie, Alicia's friend that was here last Sunday. We also, Irene and Cleve, everything that Irene's going through, you know her health issue and we know that you're the great physician and the great healer, and you can just cure whatever's bothering her, Lord. And we ask that you watch over Jaden, and hopefully when that pain comes out, he'll be as good as new, because he's faithful in ringing that bell. But I think he could grab that rope a lot better with that finger fixed. And we also ask for Brother Mike Combs, 
We know he's getting stronger, Lord, by your hand. But we know that he isn't what he used to be. And you can make it get there, Lord. We ask that you just touch everyone, Lord. You know what's going on in this world. Things are really not looking good down here. But you already know that. We ask that you watch over each and every one of us. We ask this in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> the encouraging scripture today that I get is Ephesians 3, verses 17, 18, and 19. And when you have it, say amen. Amen. All right. Amen on the rest. I do. Okay. Ephesians three seventeen through nineteen. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, and depth, and height. And to know the love of Christ, which patheth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen. 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 Wow. All the big ones there. Yes. Remember that. All. And I don't have five pages. This. Deer that got caught in the uh, headlights. I thought maybe. Poor child, he got caught in trouble. Oh. <laughs> the yeah. There is no, there is no Christian walk without the love of God. The love of God is the epicenter of Christianity. It is the love of God that led to salvation. Out of God's love, he gave up his son, Jesus Christ, so that he could stand in our place and take all the consequences for the sin we were born into. It is love that compelled Jesus Christ to walk on this earth and reach out to the oppressed, the overlooked and the maltreated. Love compelled Christ to heal those who were struck down by infirmities and lifelong ailments. Without love, we wouldn't have a chance on this earth. Love kept Christ focused on the mission ahead of him. Even after he had been betrayed, abandoned, beaten, and mocked. Any other person would have retaliated or given up long in advance, but not Jesus. There were times Jesus would enter a city and he would be mocked, 
and reduced to being seen as a carpenter's son? There were times where Jesus was called demonic. People threatened to kill him on a regular basis. He was looked down upon, but he never let any of his, none of this face him. Even on the cross, when he was in excruciating pain, he managed to plead for forgiveness on behalf of the people who supported his crucifixion. In fact, in the face of torture, Christ did not think of himself. He thought of the souls in front of him. The love of God has the power to transform the darkest hearts in the world. It has the power to heal lifelong wounds and restore broken hearts. The love of God breaks through fortified barriers and touches the coldest hearts. When we, the body of Christ, walk in one accord, the love of God, we become an unstoppable force. When we refuse to allow malice into our hearts and we choose to love everyone around us, things begin to change. Lives change for the better. Families are brought back together. Most importantly, people see Christ in us. It is the love we express that will teach people what to expect. When they hear of the love of God, we are the ones who show them what it means to love God. We are their first point of reference. This is why we need to be rooted and established in love. It is the only way we are going to be able to move effectively as missionaries of God. If you'll bow your head. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the scriptures, we thank you for the encouraging reading. We understand, Father, how much love it had to take to send your son, knowing what he was going to endure and his willingness to do what you wanted him to do, our Lord and Savior, for all that he did. And we thank you so much on this day that he beat death and rose again for us to give us that everlasting life so we could even be closer. We ask that so many people out there need to know and we need to have your love in our hearts to let them know. We ask that you give us the courage to carry on the strength that we need and the love. We ask all this in our Savior, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. In his name, amen. If everyone will turn to the hymnals to page 228, Christ the Rose.
sorry for this, but our organist isn't here today. And I had the forethought because the good Lord told me, he may not be there, you better have all them songs on your phone. rotation on the phones. I guess I won't worry about it. Everybody got it? Oh. 
The song that I got, I, sometimes I go on YouTube trying to find every one of these songs, and some of them drop a verse, add a verse, but according to the hymnal on this one, just kind of ended the chorus a little bit quick. And the very last one that I have is in the blue book. And it's page 21. On my father's side. song since I first heard it. Isn't this one that we're answering? It's similar. It's similar, but He 
said, you see, I'm the king of kings that's on my father's side. On my mother's side, my name is Jesus. But on my father's side, they call me Emmanuel. On my mother's side, now I'm 12 years. But on my father's side, I just always been. I'm assuming you do have a song. Would you mind if I play one song more before we come up and sing? We don't have the music in our books for this. How's your singing voice? How's your singing voice? Step on up. I don't know how to sing. Well, neither. I don't sing that no, way. I, mean, I don't know when to start, when to stop. Well, that's, why, that's, all that's, that's why I got this um, on my phone. What are you singing? And they, sing and they sing the words too. Who's singing? So, oh, just step on And Gene, you want to come up? It, it, it isn't that bad of one, and I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you why. Mom picked this song. That is my song. It's Mom's, Mom's song. It's Mom's song. But you know whose song this came from? His book. The music that comes out of the phone will overcast your voice. Okay. It's all right. All right. This is yeah. We should warn you sometimes. <laughs> when I think of now he came.
practice all that much. Amen, amen, amen. Wonderful song, wonderful song. Jesus had for us. Crucifixion was invented by the Persians in 300 BC and perfected by the Romans in 100 BC. It is the most painful death ever invented by man and is where we get our term excruciating. 
It was reserved primarily for the most vicious of male criminals. Jesus refused the anesthetic wine, which was offered to him by the Roman soldiers because of his promise in Matthew 6, 21. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Jesus was stripped naked and his clothing divided by the Roman guards. This was the fulfillment in Psalms 22, 18. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. The crucifixion of Jesus guaranteed a horrific, slow, painful death, having been nailed to the cross. Jesus now had an impossible anatomical position to maintain. Jesus' knees were flexed at about 45 degrees. He was forced to bear his weight with the muscles of his thighs which is not an anatomical position, which is possible to maintain for more than a few minutes without severe cramping in the muscles of the thigh and calf. Jesus' weight was borne on his feet with nails driven through them. As the strength, <clears throat> the strength of his muscles of Jesus' lower limbs tired, the weight of his body had to be transferred to his wrists, his arms, and his shoulders. Within a few minutes of being placed on the cross, Jesus' shoulders were dislocated. Minutes later, his elbows and wrists became dislocated. The result of these upper limb dislocations is that his arms were nine inches longer than normal, as clearly as shown on the shroud. In addition, prophecy was filled, fulfilled in Psalms 22:14. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. The problem was that Jesus could not easily push down on the nails in his feet because of the muscles in his legs <coughs> were extremely fatigued and, and severe cramps. Unlike Hollywood movies about the crucifixion, the victim was extremely active. The crucified victim was psychologically forced to move up and down on the cross, a distance of about 12 inches, in order to breathe. The process of respiration caused excruciating pain mixed with absolute terror of asphyxiation. The movements became less frequent as Jesus became increasingly exhausted, but the terror of imminent death by asphyxiation forced him to continue in his efforts to breathe. Jesus was covered in blood and sweat. Throughout all this, he was completely naked, and the leaders of the Jews, the crowds, and the thieves on both sides of him were jeering and swearing and laughing at him. In addition, Jesus' own mother was watching. Psychologically, Jesus' body was undergoing a series of catastrophic terminal events. He could not maintain adequate ventilation of his lungs and was now in the state of hyperventilation. His blood oxygen level began to fall and he developed hypoxia, which is low blood oxygen. This rising CO2 level stimulated his heart to beat faster in order to increase the delivery of oxygen and the removal of CO2. The respiratory center in Jesus' brain sent urgent messages to his lungs to breathe faster, and Jesus began to pant. Due to the nailing of Jesus to the cross and his increasing exhaustion, he was unable to provide more oxygen to his oxygen-starved body. Jesus' heart beat faster and faster. His pulse rate was probably about 220 beats per minute, the maximum normally sustainable. Jesus had drunk nothing for 15 hours since 6 p.m. the previous evening. He had endured a scourging which ne nearly killed him. He was very dehydrated and his blood pressure fell alarmingly. His blood pressure was already probably about 80 over 50. He was in the first degree of shock, tachycardia, 
that tachopiana, which is excessive fast respiratory rate. By noon, his heart probably began to fail. His lungs began to fill up with pulmonary edema. This only served to ex exasperate his breathing, which is already severely compromised. Jesus said, I thirst because his body was crying for fluids. He could not breathe properly and was slowly suffocating to death. This fluid in his, around his heart caused cardiac tamp tamponade, which is fluid around his heart, which prevented his heart from beating properly. To slow the process of death, the soldiers would put a small wooden seat on the cross, which would allow Jesus the privilege of bearing his weight on his sacrum. which is located at the base of the spine, the upper back, upper and back part of the pelvic cavity. The effect of this was that it could take up to nine days to die on a cross. When Romans wanted to expedite death, they would simply break the legs of the victim, causing the victim to suffocate in a matter of minutes. This was called cruciferatum. At three o'clock in the afternoon, was when Jesus said, it is finished. At that moment, he gave up his spirit and died. When the soldiers came for Jesus to break his legs, he was already dead. Not a bone of his body was broken in fulfillment of the prophecy. Jesus died after six hours of the most excruciating and terrifying torture ever invented. As per the holy books, Jesus died so that everyone accepting him could go to heaven. I have a couple of these, I'll kind of, because I only read part of it. I know we've had a lot of people already sing, but we can do this. Please, would you happen to have a song that you'd like to come up and play? And play? I don't, but I'm looking right now. <laughs> you have something in mind? I'll talk to it. I'm looking. Got him in the, in the hymn book.
just so fun. Katie, would you like to take up the offering? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you as we take up the offering for your church. May it be abundant and be used for your service, Lord, your church. We ask all of this in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. speak loud enough without it. One more prayer. Bow our heads as we pray for Pastor Gene and his service and that. So if you'll bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you one more time. We ask that you lay your hand upon Pastor Gene's shoulder as he delivers the message for today. Touch each and every one of us so our minds can take it and understand it and put it in our heart for each and every one that's sitting in this church loves you dearly. We ask that you wrap your arms around each and every one of us and pastor as he delivers your word that you would put in his mind and heart. We ask all of this in your son's holy name, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 I'm just learning to keep my beard out of it. Don't pump myself on the chest too much. You know, as we uh, a little loud. As we look at this day, Easter Sunday, we have to reflect back at what Friday was, as Sister read about that crucifixion, and how these are all going together, but what's coming. It is Sunday. Friday's gone. Sunday's here. And Jesus is coming. He is coming. We're going to start off in chapter 26 of Matthew. 26, 26, as a matter of fact. <coughs> what a day we've, I've had, already had. We, uh, our church has been exploding here lately. In fact, I had one gentleman say, just before we, before church started, he's just walked around and he goes, I hope I don't have a place to sit today. <laughs> and I says, I have a feeling that's going to come true. He didn't have a place to sit. He did a couple other people. What a blessing. Amen. Now we know that we always have what we call Christians, right? They can take it for what it's worth. Right? I wouldn't call them that if they'd show up every week, right? But there was a lot of people that's just been hungry, right? And they're coming in, and they're coming in. So it's just a blessing. What a blessing it was. And young people worshiping. And a baptism of a 13 year old. Yeah. What a beautiful sight that was. And I had to cry because it was my great granddaughter. Uh -huh. Yeah, I get a phone call Saturday morning. Grandma, can I be baptized? And I says, Well, let's have a little talk. 
Yes. She was excited. <laughs> and her twin sister had already been baptized a couple months ago. So what a growth has happened in that family. Amen. The mother and the father are very grounded and it's beautiful. Just watch them grow. So Matthew 26, 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Now many times this scripture comes up because we know this is part of the Last Supper. And as I said before, you know, we are into Sunday. Friday is past. And this happened on Thursday. I'm not going to drink of the vine. Everything that Jesus says is lined up. So as they were celebrating Passover, and that's what we're doing also, this is Passover. It's a Jewish ritual. It's been in the Hebrew theology for hundreds and hundreds of years. Very important to how they go about their Passover. It's just extremely important to them. But tonight it's a little bit different. Tonight doesn't represent a lamb. This represents this lamb. That's his body. And that's his blood. And he gave thanks. He gave thanks. This had been done hundreds of times. Their ancestors had been doing it for hundreds of years. But that year was very different. That year was very different. He took the cup and he gave thanks. And gave it to all of them. All of them. Not just the few to all of them. It is very different. This doesn't just represent the shed blood of the lamb way back in Egypt. But this time it says, look close again at verse 28, please. Because it says, for this is my blood of a new covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sins. This is new. This is a new covenant. This is not the old covenant, the Old Testament. Things are changing. And we need to say, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. This is this different. Things are changing. People don't always understand that. They want to reflect back into the Old Testament. They want to do things and follow that Old Testament. Uh, Jesus said, but this is my blood. The disciples had been with Jesus at the Last Supper as he broke the bread and gave them the drink of the vine. And he spoke of blood and he spoke of brokenness. They had grieved together as he had plainly told them that he was going to be betrayed. And that they had looked very fearful into their own hearts. Because somebody was going to betray him. You have to understand, as we read the, our scripture, and we see the love of Jesus Christ, and what it must have been like for him to speak to them, and look him in the eye and say, somebody's going to betray me. Right? We all have that problem. We look in the mirror and say, Oh Lord, my sin. My 
my sin is why you hung on that cross. Each one of them looked at themselves, thinking, is it I? Is it me? Is it me he's talking about? Many of his disciples that were with him in the garden as he went out to pray. He prayed in agony, prayed for such a long time. And they finally fell asleep from exhaustion. And then there was Judas, who really came to be betray him. They realize exactly the horror of what his earlier words really meant. The disciples tried to defend Jesus, but who in the world could stand up against these highly trained Romans? The Romans showed up and they're going to take him away. Judas was betraying him. Again, we are talking about last Friday night, aren't we? There for a brief second, hope jumped into their hearts. Because Jesus said, I can pray to my Father and he can have 12 legions of angels come down. And for that brief moment, they found hope. They had seen him do lots of miracles. And instantly that hope was crushed because he then said, Oh, but how then could the scriptures be fulfilled? The scriptures had to be fulfilled. You know, if they stopped what was going on, the scriptures not going to be fulfilled. The disciples followed Jesus at a distance as these Roman soldiers took him away. They were afraid. They were terrorized. They lurked in the shadows. They hung out behind the gates. They watched from a distance. As he, put, as he was put through the mockery of six different trials, between that horrible night and the faithful morning, remember these trials happened after midnight to the early morning. They heard of everyone else's fabricated evidence. They heard the outright lies against Jesus of Nazareth. And their hearts continued to sink. Every time, six trials went on. And they kept hearing, guilty, guilty. First, it was before Ananias, the former high priest. Then they dragged Jesus to Caiaphas, the current high priest. Then they took him before the Sanhedrin, the ruling class, the ruling religious council of the Jews. Then before Pilate, the designated ruler that was sent from Rome. Number five, before King Herod. Remember King Herod? He was a pawn king. He served Rome, but pretended to be a religious Jew. And then one more time, he goes back to Pilate. And each and every time, the verdict was guilty, guilty, guilty. But he wasn't guilty. The disciples saw Jesus scourged in the judgment hall of Pilate. Scourged and whipped as what was described there. I'm not going to go into that again. It was terrible. It was terrible, and it was terrible. What he went through, and the scriptures said he had to go through that. He must go through it. He had to go through it. The disciples watched this wild, crazy mob being influenced by the Sanhedrin, the religious. I pause right there because I'm telling you, you know how I preach against tomorrow in our government that's going to be against us. But you can bet that the ruling class of the high religious folks are going to be leading that charge against us. That's, right. that's what's going to happen. 
just as it happened with Jesus Christ. At that time, it was called the Sanhedrin. Who knows what their ruling body is going to be like when it comes down on us just before Jesus comes. Jesus is on the cross. And he utters these words. It is finished. It is finished. But you have to understand that in their hearts, in their hearts, all these people that are there chanting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. The Sanhedrin's, the Roman guards, everybody's chanting out against him. And he says, it is finished. But what they heard was, I am finished. There's a big difference that goes on there. I am finished from it is finished. The screams that went on. The final verdict. He's dead. He's gone. And it's over. We see. Many of us have watched those horrible videos such as Passion of the Christ, but others similar to that, where his body is beaten to a pulp, totally unrecognizable. And they were sure that he was gone. But Easter Sunday is something different. We have read the book and we know that Easter Sunday is here. But those people did not read the book. They had no clue. The disciples had watched Jesus scourged. They had watched him hang. They watched him suffer on the cross. They probably were there as the body fell onto the ground. And as it was taken away to be put in the grave. At that time, Easter Sunday was not a happy, joyous occasion. Right? They all woke up to, well, what happened to our leader? What happened to our leader? He's gone. He's brutalized. What's going to happen? We look at this as a today, excuse me, <clears throat> as this ultimate victory. And why didn't they understand? Why didn't they see it? Today it's beautiful and powerful as we see Christ has arisen. Amen. Amen. But they had to drag themselves out of bed with all those ugly memories in our mind, right? And we don't like those memories. We don't like, as Sister Red, that horrible stuff. You guys may want to step back and watch the movie The Passion again and just see how terrible and what our Lord and Savior went through. It was put and developed for a very specific reason, so that people would understand what our Savior did, what God allowed to happen to His Son. 2,000 years ago, on that first Easter morning, they weren't thinking about a resurrection. It never crossed their mind. They were so overwhelmed with what had just happened with their Master's death, they just couldn't believe it. And we have to understand and get off our high horses because we read the Bible and we say, but oh, Jesus is alive. Our friends and family, they don't know that. And they don't know this Jesus. And it's terrible. They see the movies and they watch that scourging. And it almost has no effect on them. It's just another movie. It just doesn't affect them. That's 
That's for us to help them learn, isn't it? Yep. Amen. Thank goodness that we don't have to go through that agony anymore. Because we have seen the Easter Sunday. We have seen the resurrection. And as the little grave there shows, there's nobody in there. Amen. Right? Nobody's there. And there's no blood on that cross. That's right. It's, it's done. It's final. It's finished. Just for noteworthy, if you're taking notes, there's a video you might want to look up. His name is S.M. Lockridge. It's called, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. Powerful, powerful, powerful sermon. He's a man from the early 1900s that just had a wonderful, audible voice, and he described that. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. Sunday's here. Sunday is here. It is today. There is no Easter Sunday without that horrible Friday where the skies grew dark and the earth began to tremble. But Jesus knew no sin, knew no sin. But he became sin for us. A holy God will not live with sin. Right. He's not going to. <clears throat> and our sacrificial lamb is hanging on that cross and he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God cannot have sin around him. Cannot. Well, but it's only Friday, but Sunday's coming. It's Friday, and at that moment, Jesus goes to the temple and rips the veil. The veil that only the priest could go through and talk to God himself. And he rips that veil from top to bottom which at that moment opens the door for you and for me to speak to our God personally. We don't have to wait anymore. We don't have to wait. It's Friday, this story. It's Friday. But Sunday's around the corner. It's on his way. Jesus was hanging on the cross. Heaven was weeping. Hell was out there throwing a party. That's because it's Friday, and they don't know about Easter Sunday. Right. They don't know about it. Sunday is coming. It was a horrible Friday on 2,000 years ago. Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, the only begotten Son of God, the only perfect man, died a hideous death on the cross of Calvary. Satan was positive that he had won the victory. He was positive. That's why they thought he said, I'm done. But that's not what he said. He said, it is finished. Jesus was sure that the prophecy was disproved that happened in the Garden of Eden when he said, Jesus is going to crush the head of the serpent. Ah, you can't do that now because he's dead. Ah, little did he know. Satan's out there tromping around thinking that he has won, he's in control. We, we had this little conversation today, right? I've got to take a left hand turn. My, my son is very deep into the scripture. So we get into some weird stuff. So, at the... Jesus is dead. And he goes down to heaven, right? And he, he's having, let's just say, a conversation. The keys to hell are where? In 
in Satan's hands. He? And he goes down there to get the keys. Because he's going to be in charge of death from now on, isn't he? In your mind, does he just snatch him out of his hand? Because I'm in control? Or does he do the thing that, this is my thought is, just hand him over, mister. Just hand him over. Because God would have been a loving God. Jesus is just going to say, put your pride right here, would you? Put your pride right here. So we debated that for a little while. It was kind of a fun thing, right? Who knows? My disposition says, right? That's what I do to kids. You did something wrong? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Right, right. Just put it right there. Yeah. My son, on the other hand, wanted to snatch it out of his fingers. <laughs> on this Friday, terrible things happened. But Sunday morning, as they were waking up, there was an earthquake that rolled that stone away. That stone was rolled away so that you could peer in and say, he ain't there. Where'd he go? That's where we put him a couple days ago. He's not there. He's got that napkin all folded up. I'm finished. I'm all done. I'm done. It's complete. He's not in there. He's arisen. The lamb that was silent before the slaughter. Remember, he didn't say a word. Remember that scripture? And he was silent. He didn't fight Pilate. He didn't fight the authorities. Because as a lamb, he was willing to be sacrificed. He's got nothing to fight about. Nothing at all. The whole purpose of him stepping out of heaven was to be that perfect sacrifice. Right. And he gave his life completely, completely, without fighting. All he did was teach. The angels asked, what are you looking for? What are you looking for in here? Why do you seek the living among the dead? The living. But he was dead when I put him in there. Where is he at now? Right? That just doesn't work. <clears throat> 2,000 years ago, think about it. He's not in the tomb north of Jerusalem. He's not there today. By his spirit and his power, he's not dead. But he is alive. Amen. He's alive. It's Sunday, it's Easter Sunday, and our resurrected Christ has defeated death. He's overcome evil, he's humiliated hell, and he overpowered the grave. He outwitted poor old Satan. He brought sin to his knees. It's Sunday, and Jesus is alive. He's alive. He's alive here today. He's not dead. He's not in a tomb. He's not on a cross. Everything has changed. It's Sunday. It's Easter Sunday. And we're going to look to the sun, to the sunshine. Praise the Lord for all that he has done. We have a bunch of critics in this world. And the critics are constantly asking the question. As these Christians gather all around the world to celebrate Easter. Let us just say, think about this, and be brutally honest, is to declare this question. There's a question that critics have. And they just can't wait to talk about it. They say it's Sunday. And what difference does the resurrection of Jesus Christ really make in this world? What difference does it make? Oh my goodness. It's Easter Sunday, and what difference does it make? Now, 
all these critics still taking the day off, aren't they? Yeah. Right? Whether it's a Sunday, Monday, or Friday, they're still taking that day off. And they get paid for it mostly. They're going to take it off, but they're going to be grumbling. <laughs> well, to answer that question, you have to look in the right place. You can't just stop at Calvary. You can't just stop over there at the empty tomb. You can't go over there to the cross. You can't stop at Christmas Eve or Palm Sunday or Good Friday or even Easter to get that answer for the question. You got to go to the back of your Bible because only there is where you'll find the rest of the story. The rest of the story. Wasn't that a fun program? Only there will you find anything that makes sense to this crazy world. There is an answer. It's Sunday. But Jesus is coming. Yes. Jesus is coming. <clears throat> it's only Easter Sunday. But hey, Jesus is coming. It's Sunday. Saints are praying. Some saints are sleeping. Some are straying away. But Jesus is coming. <clears throat> On Sunday, people are struggling. Satan is conspiring. The media is criticizing. But they don't even know that Jesus is coming. It's Sunday. Sinners are running around like sheep without a shepherd. Some are crying. Others are just denying this Jesus. But they don't even know that Jesus, he's coming. On Sundays, comedians are mocking Jesus. They mock him. They rope him in with insults. They crown him with curses. But they don't know that Jesus is coming. Mm -hmm. yeah. Revelation 21. Revelation 21. As I said, you need to go to the back of the Bible. That's almost the last verse, the last chapter. Jesus is coming. Revelation 21, starting in verse 1. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. You got problems down here? Are you dealing with stuff that you don't want to deal with? <clears throat> but if you've got Jesus in your life, this is just a start. There's a better day coming. Jesus is coming. Verse 2, then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven with, from God, prepared as a bride adorns her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God with men, and he will dwell with them. Amen. Right there, guys. He's coming, this new Jerusalem, and he will come in, and he shall be with his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from every eye. There will be no death, nor sorrow, nor crying, there shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. So I have to say, and look at the devil. You got no victory. You didn't get the last word. You're not the boss over me. You're not Lord over me. My Jesus is coming. Amen. This is more than just a good Friday where he sacrificed and an Easter Sunday because tomorrow he's coming. Yep. And then we get to go home. We get to go home. 
We find ourselves dancing in the streets of gold. When John wrote in his gospel, it is finished. Jesus said, it is finished. And his enemies heard, it's finished. There's nothing more I can do. It's over. That's not what he said. Not at all. He says, there's nothing more I need to do. I'm done. I'm complete. Everything is complete. Remember the folded up napkin and all that? So important. Right? They're telling. The battle is won. Jesus has won. We may go through these different trials here on earth. We may be facing new challenges each and every day. Our country is in crazy turmoil, but Jesus is coming. Friday is over with. You've all asked for forgiveness. Jesus was buried in the grave and we've been baptized. Jesus has risen from the grave. He is alive. You've walked, risen to walk in newness of life. As we choose Jesus, we choose to walk in that newness of life with him. Jesus is coming. He is coming back. He's coming back for his church. He's coming back for his bride. That's why we spend time and read the word so that we can become pure. We can become the bride that he wants. But we're only going to become that bride with his help, with his guidance, with his love. Wow, what we have in such a loving God. Yeah. We can look to those sorrows and problems, those trials, those, <sighs> those terrible Fridays. But we can also look ahead and say, oh, wait a minute, that Easter Sunday's, com Easter Sunday's coming also. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is coming. Brother Cleveland, you want to help us with because he lives. <clears throat> yeah, it's in him. I don't know what page it was. We sung it earlier. Three fourteen. Three fourteen. Three fourteen. Thank you, brother. Hey, this is a group affair. We don't have to do. I don't have to do everything alone. I don't have to. <clears throat> I just have had, as some of you know, right? I've had this song in my heart since I woke up this morning. Yeah. I was singing it before we took off. And I sent it out to many. <clears throat> and we sang it at church this morning twice. Maybe it's three times. I don't know. Quite a few times. <laughs> sing all together. God sent his son.
gives way to victory. I see the light of glory and I know He lives because He lives. I can face tomorrow because He lives. All fear is gone. tomorrow. Yep. Hey, let's be a little closer. I can deal with today too. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. It's today. It's tomorrow. Because I know my Jesus He's coming soon. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. Praise God. Praise God. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you for your words here this evening, Lord, to encourage us. It's not just Sunday anymore, Lord. We know that your glorious return is coming. You are coming, Jesus. And you're going to come to take your church, your bride, back home with you, Lord. We look forward to that wonderful day. In Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen.